You're listening to a message from Gateway Church Geelong. We hope it blesses you. For more information about Gateway, visit gc.org.au. To come around the word this morning, you know I've um, been doing a little bit of a fitness routine lately, and and so I've been walking through Ocean Grove, and I've got a little story because the title of my message this morning is the challenge. Have you ever had challenges come across your way? Challenges that have come into your life, into your family. Every one of us can can say today safely, we've all understand challenge. We've all been in challenge. But I had a very interesting challenge this week and I had this lady, I was walking back and and she just ran straight past me and I wasn't in the mood for running. I was just kind of plodding along. It was the morning. I hadn't had my coffee yet. And so she just runs past me and straight away, I felt challenge burst forth from me. And so this challenge, she comes and she's running across and I'm like, oh, dang it, I didn't want to run this morning, but she's inspired me so much by her challenge of running, I'm going to start running too. So I start running and I get such a pace up that I actually start to pass her. And she's like, awesome, you're doing so well. And I said, hang on a minute, I actually wasn't going to run this morning, it's you. You challenged me, you've inspired me, and now I'm running. I didn't even want to run this morning. So she thought that that was hilarious and started laughing. And so I actually went past her then because I'd picked up her pace. So further up, I'd stopped and, and then she came up to where I was and she's like, so, so where's your car parked? And I said, oh, my car's parked just further of Ocean Grove. And she said, oh, my car's up there. Let's run back to the car together. And I'm like, oh, dang it, again. And so I'm inspired again by the challenge and I start running really hard with her, the sweat's pouring off my face. But when I get to that point of where we finish, I'm like, I did it. I got inspired by challenge and I actually progressed further than what I actually ever thought I could progress. You know, her name's Loretta. She'll be stuck in my mind now for quite a while. Every time I want to plot along, she will be there reminding me and inspiring me to run. But the next day, I had a very different challenge come across me. I was walking again, the same trail, and then there was this girl. She wasn't running, but she was walking. She was walking so fast, she could have been speed walking for the Olympics. And so she's walking, walking, and I'm like, right, challenge again, I'm after you. And so I start walking and I'm, I'm trying to build up speed and I'm trying to increase the rate of my feet walking, but I cannot catch up to her. It doesn't matter what I do, I'm trying to kick into all the endurance that is within me and I cannot find any more capacity or speed to catch up with her. And now when challenge comes my way, this day by this new girl, I am not inspired anymore. I am irritated. I'm irritated that I cannot catch her. I'm irritated that she is flying past me and she's not even running. And so anyway, I couldn't catch up. So I thought, eh, let it go. And so I'm walking on the way back and lo and behold, Miss Speedy comes past me again. And the challenge is there again. And I'm still irritated. And I said to God, I don't even know this girl. Why am I irritated by her? And I go through all the, like, this is not legit. It's just not logical for me to be irritated. I haven't had coffee with her. I don't have relationship with her. And yet she's irritating me. And then I suddenly stopped. Isn't those moments when God teaches you, if you can just get a hold of those moments and stop and assess and go, God, what are you trying to show me here? There's a lesson to be learnt here. And I felt God say, I've got to say this bit because this is just the funny bit. So as I'm trying to catch her the second time, every time she goes around a bush where she can't see me anymore, I start to run because I'm that irritated. And then when she goes around another bush, I run again. And you know what? I still couldn't catch up to her. And I thought, you have irritated me. But you know what I felt God was saying? Challenge comes to all of us at times. Challenge will either irritate you or it will inspire you. Challenge will either irritate you to the core where it makes you want to digress in your progress or challenge can come your way where it inspires you and makes you progress to a capacity that you never thought you could run in. Our declaration verse over the church for this year is Proverbs 4.12. When you walk, your steps will not be impeded for your path 
path will be clear and open. And when you run, you will not stumble. This year, God is saying over to you, when challenge comes your way, He wants you to take on the response of being inspired because you have an understanding and a knowledge that God has not forsaken you, that God is right along the path with you. He's going to make it clear. He's going to make it wide and open that you could run where you never thought you could run. When you walk this year, your steps will not be impeded for the Lord your God will make that path clear and open. And when you run this year, you will not stumble. That is a promise from our God for this body this year and over our lives. Aren't you glad that God is ordering our steps? Aren't you glad that God is by your side this year and always? I want to look from the text of chapter 40 from the book of Genesis this morning. Let's all turn to Genesis chapter 40. Verse 2, I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. And we're looking at the story and the life of Joseph this morning. You see, as we come into this chapter, we're meeting Joseph after he has just had a dream where everyone is going to bow down to him. What we need to understand about Joseph is that he is 17 at the time that he actually receives this dream from God. But now we come into Genesis chapter 40 and he's now found himself in a jail. So not only does he have the challenge of, of the dream that he got and got put into a pit because his brothers were jealous, but now down the track, he's in a jail. Incredible challenge once again. He's been in this place before. You know, it's so easy that when we've been in that place before, he could have easily digressed to once in a pit always in a pit, but we see him allow himself to move with purpose within impossible odds against yet against him, yet he defies them. In Genesis 40 uh, verse 2, and Pharaoh was furious with his two officials, the chief cupbearer who was the butler and the chief baker. Verse 3, so he put them in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard in the jail, the same place where Joseph was in prison. So we see here Joseph who's had having an encounter with a butler and a baker. You know, a butler is a cupbearer. A cupbearer holds the king's cup and ensures the king doesn't drink any poison. So his job to the king is of vital importance to not only the king, but the kingdom that he serves. Then you have the baker who takes all types of ingredients from around him and can make any product. You see, in our lifetime, in our environments right now, there are all different personalities that are around us, like the cupbearer and like the baker. The cupbearer holding things in people's lives who hold on to what has been given to them, important things. Then there is in the baker who gets ingredients from life and brings form and appearance and produces outcomes. You see, we have these personalities. We have these peoples all around us. And what we need to do is ask the question, who holds the important things of your life? Who holds the important things of your life? We need to be mindful who we allow to hold the things in our lives and who we allow to make things in our lives. If we get these mixed up, it can create outcomes in our lives that God never intended for us to walk in. We need to ask and stop and see who is in our kingdom and who is holding the important areas of our lives. Who is making outcomes of the ingredients from our lives? Who's holding you and who's putting things together in your life? Who holds your image and who is making your identity? Who is holding your image and who is making your identity? You know, it's so interesting when I ask people and I have conversations and I say, do you love yourself? I pose that statement, I, I pose that question to them. Do you love yourself? The amount of people from the body of Christ that cannot answer me with confidence in the answer yes is staggering. Do you love yourself? 
You see, I remember at an age, I was in grade three at primary school. And in our primary school in the playground, there was a massive fort. And I remember climbing up the ladder to get to the top of the fort. And as I was looking over the playground and over the oval and over the suburb that the school was in, I remember having this defining moment with God, this encounter where I knew that I loved myself. And from grade three, I have been able to confidently ask that question, answer that question, do I love myself? Yes, I do. I love myself because I love who God has made me to be. Because when I look in the reflection of the mirror, that's not the image that I am loving. It's not the image I am to love. It is the image that God has fashioned and formed. The way He's made my heart, the way He's made my spirit, the way He's made my mind. He's fashioned and formed me in His image. That's the image I love, not the reflection in the mirror. The reflection in the mirror has all the details that sometimes make us think, oh, I'm not sure about that bit, but I'm not looking at my reflection. I'm looking at my image of the one who made me. That's how you can step out of from where you are in your mindset and start to realise the God who fashioned and formed you in His image. That's the reflection that you are loving. It's time for the body of Christ to start assessing who their image is in God and realise that He, that's the truth. He's fashioned and formed you. You're loving His truth of His Word. That's what I'm aligning my mindset to. And that's why I can walk in the freedom of the knowledge that I love how God made me. Who holds your image and who makes your identity? Who holds your peace? And who is making you steady? Who holds your confidence? And who is making your hope? In Psalm 40 verse 2, it says, He, God, Jesus, He is the one who lifted me out of the slimy pit. He's the one who carried me out of the mud and the mire. He's the one who sets my feet on a rock and gives me a firm place to stand. Jesus Christ is the King who wants to hold everything of you and make everything of your life. He is your hope in your past, your present and your future. You see, Joseph had a dream of people bowing to him, but here he is in a place of serving people, the butler and the baker that are supposed to be serving him. You know, God will often put us into seasons where we will have to humble ourselves to see when stretched what's really inside of us. What we need to understand is when God stretches us, He gives us the grace, which is the ability and His strength to carry it out. You know, when stretching, when challenge comes along, it's a bit like rubber band. You have to pull the rubber band back first to get enough tension so it goes further. Sometimes you feel like you're being pulled backwards. You feel like you're digressing. You feel like you're not making any progress. But when you're being stretched, God is stretching your capacity so you go further. Don't make it look, don't be deceived that you think that you're taking three steps back. You're not. You're being stretched to increase your capacity, not within yourself. Not within your own strength, not with your own capabilities, not with your own mind. He's stretching you backwards to realise without Him, you cannot go further. God wants to stretch you with His capacity, with His strength this morning. Joseph knows confinement. He knows how confinement feels as the pit represents the trauma of his past. So challenge is here. God could have arranged anything, yet there was a bigger plan, a bigger picture. Greater redemption was at stake and he did not know it. It wasn't just about Joseph, it was about a whole nation. This was all about timing that was to affect a whole nation, not just about right now. Are you willing to go through the uncomfortable the tension, the challenge, the stretch for the bigger picture God has for all those around you in your city, even when you don't understand it. And that's a question, isn't it, that comes to all of us 
Can we trust him? Can we search for him even when we don't have all the details of the understanding of the picture? When the dream is not meeting the reality. Who do we go to? Who do we go to? Who do we turn to when we feel completely broken in our life? Let us never be deceived into thinking that we are looping around the mountain. Can we possibly perceive through God's lens of seeing and thinking that you could actually be progressing spiritually? Maybe not naturally, but spiritually in God's greater plan. You see, Joseph was balancing the call of royalty with the reality of prison. Verse 5, Then the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt, who were confined in jail, both had a dream the same night. Each man with his own dream and each dream with its own interpretation. You know, dreaming in confinement, amazing. It doesn't look like I should be dreaming in prison, but can we still have dreams? Can we still have God communicate with us, to us? Can we still allow God to speak to us even when we're in confinement? Can we still be sensitive to the voice of God even when we feel we're not where we should be? Can you hang on to your dream in confinement? Verse 6, when Joseph came to them in the morning and observed them, behold, they were dejected. And he asked Pharaoh's officials who were with him in confinement in his master's house, why are your faces so sad today? Joseph was sensitive enough to realise someone's need, even when his own need was so great. Are we sensitive enough? Are we open enough? Are we mindful enough in the Spirit of God? Are we sensitive enough to see the need? Or do we get so irritated by God that bitterness starts to seep in? Can He still get a hold of you even when it looks like your reality is nothing like the dream Him promise He gave you? In verse 8 it says, Then they said to Him, We have had a dream. And there is no one to interpret it. Then Joseph said, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell it to me, please. He's in a prison again. He hasn't done anything wrong again. Yet here he is declaring the power and authority of the interpretation of God. Joseph doesn't realise that right in this moment that his situation has just moved in progression. Though he was still in prison, there was something so pivotal that he has tapped into because he's tapped into his purpose and it's changed his position. He didn't come and get freed by the warden in this natural confinement, but something shifted in the supernatural as he came into alignment with his purpose and his calling. He knew what happened last time when he interpreted what God gave him. Yet here he is from the pit in his memory. Here he is again, standing here in a jail, moving in mission and purpose. How? You know, I don't know how he felt, but the truth is he was moving in God's plan and his bigger picture. But that's the word. He was moving towards God. He was moving with God. so vital that it would affect thousands of lives and generations to come. God was with Joseph, but Joseph kept moving with God. You know, in chapter 39, verses 21 to 23, it says this, But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favour in the sight of the chief jailer. The chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in jail so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. How did he do it? I believe God did it with him and for him. Genesis chapter 40 verses 9. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and Joseph interprets it. And verse 14 says, after he interprets it, Joseph says to him, now please 
only keep me in your mind when it goes well with you. And please do me a kindness by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For I was in fact kidnapped from the land of Hebrews. And even here I have done nothing that they should have put me in the dungeon. Verse 9, it says, So the chief cupbearer, he's told his dream. He interprets, it, but he doesn't remember him. Who is the one who holds our deliverance? Who is the one who possesses our freedom? Is it man or is it God? Let's go back to Psalm 40 verse 2. He, God, lifts me out of the slimy pit. He lifts me out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. And you see in verse 23, yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. You see, your deliverance can never be produced by man. Two full years later, Joseph was delivered from the jail. But we see the answer to why the timing was so necessary. You see that Pharaoh now comes into a place where he has a dream and that Joseph translates the interpretation that belongs to God. In Genesis 41 verse 1, it says, Now it happened at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream. He was so troubled by this dream. He sent for all the magicians and all its wise men throughout Egypt, but none of them could interpret them. Then the cupbearer finally remembers. Hallelujah. Thank you for keeping me on your mind. And Joseph is called. Joseph translates the interpretation from God. Let me just say this something. How do I know if it's a dream dream from God and it's a pizza dream? God will always give you the interpretation. He always has the interpretation from you, for you. Psalm 40 verse 2. Now it happened at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had this dream. Then Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this in whom is a divine spirit? You see, Joseph is hearing this dream. Joseph interprets this dream that God gives him the interpretation to. And then once he's interpreted, Pharaoh finally gets the translation. Pharaoh finally gets the answer. And this is what he says. Can we find a man like this? This was a man who was in jail. This was a man who was sold into slavery. Now this is a man in the palace courts talking to the Pharaoh. Can we find a man like this? Yes, you can. He was just downstairs in your jail. In whom is a divine spirit? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has informed you, hang on, he's gone to all the magicians. He's gone to all the other, all the people that could try and interpret dreams. But now he's saying, since God has informed you of all this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house. And according to your command, all my people shall do homage. Only in the throne, I will be greater than you. What a statement from a king. It wasn't just Joseph coming into the palace. Joseph was ushering in the king of kings into the kingdom. Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put the gold necklace around his neck. He had him ride in the second chariot and they proclaimed before him, bow the knee. And he set him over all the land of Egypt. He's now moved into the reality of the dream that God gave to him. What a challenge to go through it all. Yet what a sensitive heart he kept to moving with God and not away from God. That's the greatest challenge, the biggest picture, redemption for a whole nation to rule with authority, favour and the power of the true God in the kingdom. You know, he is the only one who can deliver you out of any pit in your life. And this morning I want to look at three keys to get you out of the pit. He's the only one that can deliver you out of the pit in your life. So if you're wanting to pursue Proverbs 4, 16, 
and you feel like you're not running with progress. You may feel like you're hindered and consistently stumbling. I believe that these are three powerful keys to put into practice to make you continually progress in God. You know, the first one is that, is to cry out. It's to cry out to your God, to cry out to your Saviour, to cry out He who is hope and holds your deliverance. In Psalm 116, it says in verse 1 to 2 from the NIV, I love the Lord for He heard my voice. Come on, that's assurance this morning. He hears your voice every time you cry out, every time you speak to Him, every time you pray. God says to you, He hears your voice this morning. You will never go unheard by the God that we serve this morning. He hears your voice. He heard my cry for mercy because He turned. He turned His ear to me. I will call on Him as long as I live. You know, God is sovereign as we know and He has His own reasons for responding in the ways He does. But if I look at deliverance from what I know, He usually waits for us to cry out so He can remove all doubt about who it is that came to our rescue. God will forever be more interested in you knowing your healer than experiencing His healing. You knowing your deliverer than knowing your deliverance. The King of all creation wants to reveal Himself to you. Our cries blow the lid of the walls, the very walls that would try and confine us in our lives. So we're gonna cry out to Him. The second thing is to confess. You know, confession in its widest sense is our means of bearing our hearts and souls before God. Confession is a way we agree with what God says about Himself and about us. Confession takes place every time you tell God how much you need Him. Tell Him what's on your mind, what kind of mess you're in, who's in it with you, who's holding you back, who's on your case and what's on your heart, who's on your nerves. Who's broken your heart? Even if your first impulse is to think it's Him, as long as you can feel it, let it out. Ask the Holy Spirit if there is anything you are overlooking. Remember, God is always after relationship, always offering forgiveness. In Psalm 145 verse 18, it says, The Lord is near to all who call upon Him, to all who call upon Him, in truth. Truth. So we're going to cry out to Him. We're going to confess to Him. And lastly, we're going to agree. So we cry out, we confess and now agree in 1 John chapter 5, verses 14. It says, This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of Him. You see, we can know with all assurance, according to His truth, His Word that God's will for you is to get you out of that pit. If you will agree to the process, that's a challenge. Let's be real. If we agree to the process, waiting upon God as He begins shifting, shoving and rearranging things for your release, you can go ahead because it will happen in your life, just as God promises in His Word. Can you bring your words into alignment to God's Word? God loves His Word and He will always respond every time He hears it spoken. We might just not know it. You know, when I was in Adelaide through January for our holidays, I caught up with my friend who was my youth pastor and I still call her my pastor today. And we were having a conversation and we were talking about things that had happened 20 years ago in my past. And it was to do with promises that I thought would happen, things that I would move into within, within a church space, things that I was promised, things that were talked to me, but it didn't happen the way I thought it would happen. Those things that were promised to me, the excitement that I felt that I was moving into suddenly became walls of confinement all around me that I could see what God wanted me to progress into. 
but it wasn't happening the way I thought it would. And so I started to come into this place of confinement. And most of the time when we're in a place of confinement, we don't always know it. And so I started talking to her and and she started to shed some light on things I didn't know. She said to me, you know, when I was on staff at the church, I was told that I was just waiting time for you to get there that I would move aside so that you could come in. And I'm like, I didn't even realise all this. And I went home still carrying this heaviness of 20 years. It doesn't mean that I thought about all the time, but when I did talk about it, it brought up all the emotions and started to bring me into that place of confinement in my mind and my heart. And when I got home, I started having a conversation with Lee about it. And he said to me, he said, you know, a normal grieving progress takes three to five years, but you're still grieving 20 years later. And it hit me. It hit me in my spirit. It hit me. It just hit me everywhere like a loaded shotgun. Because there was realisation, why am I still here? I've moved on in so many ways, but I want this confinement to be lifted off of me. So the very first thing that I did is I cried out to the Holy Spirit and I said, Holy Spirit, You're the counsellor, You're the guide, You're the comfort. Your role is to take me to Jesus who is all truth and His truth makes me walk in freedom because He sets me free. Set my confinement free. What am I to do, Holy Spirit? Why am I still here 20 years later? And two weeks later, I heard God speak to me so clear. You could have smacked me up the side of the head, which I wouldn't have wanted. His words were so impacting everything. Every movement, time just stood still. And he said to me, stop mourning. Stop mourning. That was it. And it broke. It broke. And let me tell you, when something's been on you for 20 years, you understand in that moment what freedom from the first time looks like. You can't tell me when somebody finally gets released from jail that never committed the crime. As soon as they step out and start to touch freedom and start to come back into relationships with their family, the taste of freedom is reality from confinement. Freedom from confinement. And this is what we all do. What do I do now? (laughs) I've done this for so long. That's the conversation I've always gone back to. The feeling I've always resided with. What do I do now, Holy Spirit? You're the guide, you're the counsel. Counsel me, Holy Spirit. Do you know that the Holy Spirit, oh, He gets so excited when you ask Him to counsel you because that's His role. He wants to counsel your life. He wants to comfort you. He wants to guide you. And let me tell you, He sees everything that you can't see because He is God. I want to put my life in His guidance. I want to put my counsel. I want to put every issue that I have. I want to put it into the comfort of the Holy Spirit because that's what He does best. He's shining in those moments when He gets to counsel you. I love the Holy Spirit. I love Him. Don't you love Him this morning? Don't you love His guidance? Don't you love His counsel and His comfort? But I said, what do I do now? And then he led me to Samuel, to the prophet Samuel. And the prophet Samuel was lamenting because King Saul, blank moment, King Saul wasn't to be king anymore. He wasn't aligning himself with God. and, And there's Samuel lamenting and mourning and mourning over what was. But he was lamenting and mourning so much that he couldn't see what was going to be. So he had to stop mourning 
And the thing that God spoke to him and spoke into my spirit is fill your horn with oil. And what that means is I want you to get moving, but get moving with me. Start filling up this vessel. Start filling up your life with what I wanna speak into your life for the next season. The old is gone. It's been stripped off of you. You've been set free, but you need to see the new. You need to see the progress. You need to see where I'm taking the church. So start spending time with me, filling up your horn with oil, anointing. Breaks the yoke. Anointing breaks the yoke of slavery and confinement, imprisonment. Anointing breaks the yoke, but I've got to get it every day and be filled and filled and filled. Why? Because it's overflowing, because He's teaching us how to fish for men. But I've got to follow Him first. Will you follow Him first? He wants to teach you things. He wants to speak into your spirit about this present moment and what He wants you to walk into for your family, your job, your life in this church. So I had to cry out to God. I had to confess to Him what I'd been carrying. But then I had to agree with the instruction. It's great to be tickled by the wonderful words of God. But unless we come into alignment, you won't see the victory and the progress to what He's promised you to walk in. Everybody loves a prophetic word. We all do. But I'd rather align myself with the Word of God when He speaks an instruction into my life. It's not about just a prophetic word. It's alignment. It's alignment. It's alignment. Because alignment is saying when you walk, you won't be held back. When you run, you won't stumble. Great. That's mine. And nobody can tell me any different because if I'm walking in alignment, I'm walking in obedience, which means I'm walking in victory because His Word does not return void. It always meets its target. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we just pray for every person right now, whether they're in confinement right now or they're not, Holy Spirit, You are the counsellor, You are the comforter, You are the guide. So Father, this day we cry out to You because we know that You are the deliverer. God, we know that You are the restorer. God, we know that You are our Saviour and our hope this morning. So God, we don't want to be in confinement any longer. We want to walk in the freedom and the power and the authority of God because that's what You've promised Your church. We are the church, the very expression of Jesus Christ on this earth. So Father, we just pray for every heart this morning. That Father, this Word will speak into their spirits and bring life and hope this morning. In Jesus' Name we pray. Amen.